Barry Leash here from the University of Brighton. And uh, what you might think is that I have a bit of a strange accent for somebody who teaches in a British institution, and that's because I have uh, spent half of my life in the United States and half of my life in the UK. So Americans think I'm British, and British people sometimes wonder where I'm from. Um, I've been asked to um, come and do a little presentation of some ideas that interest me, and I just wanted to share those with you today. So uh, my objectives are, first of all, to draw on a socioeconomic view of sustainability, um, to explore particularly the links between uh, product cycle concepts and managing 21st implications and some of, their, uh, some of the implications of this. There's some influential ideas that have uh, contributed to my thinking in this area. Um, obviously, Darwin is important. Uh, the ecological model, the idea that individuals are fitted better to their environment, that are fitted better to their environment, are more likely to survive. And if we apply that to organizations, we can also see that there has to be a compatibility, a fit between organiz organizations and their environment. Uh, and some work has been done recently looking at what are the components, what are the What's the content of organizational fit between an organization and its environment? There's also been work by Michael Porter, which is quite important, looking in particular at the changes that take place in the organizational environment and the need to be, meet this with strategy changes. And uh, also, I think we've been influenced a lot by some of the ideas of some of the, the mega trends that Nesbitt has talked about. Nesbitt spoke of mega trends, and you're probably familiar with the idea, but I quite like the quote that trends, like horses, are easier to ride in the direction in which they're already going. So part of the idea is to think about what the implications are for some of these trends for organizational design and organizational management. And what I'm interested in particular is um, a particular uh, idea uh, and applying that to the design and the management of organizations, in particular, uh, the product life cycle. Uh, and this, take, this comes to some extent from uh, Michael Porter's idea that uh, 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 strategy and organizations need to be fitted with their organizations in order to be sustainable. Uh, the product life cycle actually is a, a, a very simple model. It looks at unit sales over time uh, from the introduction of a product in the market until its removal. And the idea is to look at the evolution of a product and its smart attributes. And oftentimes this is characterized as a bell curve, sometimes it's been characterized as an S curve. But the idea is that uh, you're trying to look at what the implications are uh, for a performance of a product in its market and try to interpret that for the performance, the design, and the management of organizations. To some extent this comes from the diffusion of innovations literature. Uh, Rogers talked about the diffusion of innovations, uh, introduction, where there's little customer awareness, growth, the idea of consumer recognition and acceptance, decline in growth, more entrants coming into the market, there being more competition, maturity, where there's a sales plateau, and market saturation, and finally, decline as consumers abandon the product and start looking for others. And um, uh, Theodore Levitt's work, uh, famous article published in Harvard Business Review, actually mapped the product life cycle going through these various stages over time. Um, of course, there are a lot of questions to ask about the notion of the product life cycle. Do patterns exist? Can they be measured? How do you measure them? Which products? Can the stages be forecast? What are the conditions? How to use this? Uh, I think that I'm very interested in this as an integrating mechanism because it can be used for, uh, as, a, as a principle of organization, it can be used for um, policy and strategy of organizations, and it also can be used as a way of mapping uh, the kinds of changes uh, and that organizations need to go through in terms of their design. So here's a mapping of the life cycle of a product onto the life cycle of an organization. And what we can see is that when an organization is young and small, it needs to have a structure which is rather flexible, typically entrepreneurial. In order for an organization to grow, it must become more professionalized, more specialized. And then as the organization faces competition, uh, there are diseconomies of scale that 
pitch in and the structure needs to change. And what I'm particularly interested in is the idea of market dynamics and product cycles in particular. And I'm interested in exploring this to see what useful this, this might provide. Um, and I've been trying to do some observations and interviews of companies to find out whether this concept actually works for them and what the implications are for these companies. So if we think about the, the two key components of product cycles, we've got both the development cycle and the life cycle of organizational products. So we can classify products into products which have a very long cycle or products which have a long short cycle. And we have both elements, product development cycle, how long it takes for a product to be developed, and life cycle, how long the product lasts in the market. So if we create a kind of a two by two matrix, something like this, we can actually begin to map organizations and say, well, where do the organizations belong on this map? So perhaps you might think for a moment, can you think of an example of a product market in which there's a very long product development cycle? In other words, it takes a long time for the product to be developed and where the product also lasts a long time in the market. What would be an example of a product that takes a long time to develop and a long time that it lasts in the market. In the medical. medical, yes. Uh, perhaps pharmaceuticals? Okay. Pharmaceutical industry. Okay. And what, what are the characteristics of products in the medical market or the pharmaceuticals market? They're products that need a lot of clinical testing, uh, need a long time to be developed because of uh, uh, there are big obstacles and maybe there are many research uh, projects that need to be undertaken before discovering one that works. And so what you'd expect to find is that uh, companies that are involved in pharmaceutical research would be located at that end of the spectrum. What about another example besides pharmaceuticals? Another example of a product market in which it takes a long time for the product to be developed and it lasts a long time in the market. Long product cycles. It takes a long time for the product to be developed and it lasts a long time in the market. So, relative. Computers. <laughs> Ladies are pointing at computers. Okay, what's the nature of PCs you're talking about, for example? Yes. Yeah. Yes. How long, how, how was that? I'm not sure how long it takes to produce, but yes. I know that it stays long okay. time. Well, there's a difference between producing it and developing it, because the development cycle mm -hmm. has to do with innovation, with creation of the product. The production cycle may be slightly different, but often overlaps. Mm -hmm. So you might want to say that, suggest that pharmaceuticals would typically last longer in the market and take longer to, to prepare, and that Computers, PCs, for example, how long? How old is yours? Um, three, one years. Years. three years, two years, one year? Three years. Three years, okay, that's not bad. And what about pharmaceutical products? They might last 20 years in the market. And what is it that makes them different from computers? So that they have patents. What's the incentive for a company to make a large investment in products development unless they have some kind of protected market. So the protection is their, their, uh, their uh, We are patent. talking about the usage? Sorry? Or we are talking about the usage, the, like uh, how long it No, how long the product are we, remains are we in the market? About after I dispose no, the how long the product lacks, is yeah. being offered in the market before it is replaced. Oh. Okay. So what we expect to find is that some products at this end of the scale would have particular characteristics, and the companies would have particular characteristics. Uh, let's think of another example. Think of an example of a product market which has a very short cycle. It doesn't take very long for the product to develop, and it doesn't last very long in the market. Some technology products. Right, like? The new iPhone. Yeah. Any other examples? The ICT model, they have very short life cycles. Yes. They have very, very short life. Yes. And, and fashion is another 
In fact, sometimes the product is on the market before it has even been tested. <laughs> so one of the interesting things about the differences is but you can make comparisons. How are organizations designed and managed in those two sectors? What you'd expect to find is that organizations that are at this end of the spectrum have a very long planning cycle. Oftentimes, competition is actually between two or three major competitors. There might even be a monopoly. Whereas organizations operating at this end of the spectrum would perhaps be you know, smaller organizations. Uh, they may not, uh, they, they may have to, the market is very fragmented, so there's a lot of rivalry, a lot of competition. The market's very fragmented. So what you expect to find is that the way the organizations are designed and managed at these two ends of the spectrum are quite different. At this end of the spectrum, you find, expect to find organizations that are large in scale. You expect to find organizations that have high levels of R&D investment, perhaps 5% of turnover. You'd expect to find organizations that are very professionalized and bureaucratic, where the project that somebody works on may be longer than their life in the organization. And other examples of organizations operating at this end of the scale might be uh, nuclear power stations, space stations, aircraft. So these are organizations that are dealing in markets which have very, very large barriers to entry. It's not very easy to get into the market. What do you need to get into the market in fashion? A sewing machine, a designer. So at this end of the spectrum, what you'd expect to find are very entrepreneurial, fast-moving organizations, very informal in their structure, and with also a very high tolerance of failure, willingness to take risk. Oftentimes at this end of the spectrum, you're dealing with organizations that are not very tolerant of risk, or maybe can have zero tolerance of risk. If you're building airplanes, you can't have a tolerance for just a 1% failure rate. They all have to fly. You can't have, so you have a, a complete intolerance for failure. So what you can see is that the model is kind of useful for giving a, a map of the different kinds of organizations at different ends of the spectrum. Now what I'm interested in is not just that we're taking a snapshot and looking at organizations at different ends of the spectrum. Uh, I'm interested also in what's happening to product cycles. What's been happening to product cycles is that they are getting shorter. So what we've seen is we, we know that there's increased rivalry, increased competition, trade barriers are coming down. Uh, organizations are able to do business across national boundaries more easily. There are new competitors in the market. Information technology and computing technology does a lot of things. It means that organizations can be managed in a very geographically dispersed way. It also gives companies a lot of access to markets, to new customers, and also gives companies a lot of information about markets. So partly because of deregulation, privatization, lowering of trade barriers, increased competition, what's been happening is that the product cycle has become critical so if we look at product cycles, this represents the development cycle. This represents the life cycle. So when there was less competition and less rivalry and planning horizons were longer, organizations could take much longer to develop and plan to introduce products into the market. And they also had a much longer time to reap the benefits of uh, their sales in the market. What I'm arguing is that there's been an increase in competition and rivalry, and one of the impacts has been to shorten product life cycles. What it means is that companies are more quickly able to imitate products, so companies don't have such long periods of time to develop products, they have to be very quick. And second of all, they don't have such long periods of time uh, to sell their products in the market. So they have to be able to manage the cycles more quickly. And of course, what happens when a, when a product reaches saturation, companies have to make some decisions about what to do, a number of responses. One thing they could do is try to develop the product. Maybe, like the iPhone, introduce new variants, change the plugs, do something relatively minor to try and keep people buying the product. They could also look for new markets. But in any case, at some point, the market gets saturated, 
will decline, and then the question is how to withdraw from the market. So organizations of all kinds are having to deal with these pressures. What I'd argue is that if we go back to this diagram here, the companies that are used to dealing with very stable environments where there's relatively little rivalry, where there's long-term planning horizons that are suddenly facing new competitors, more competition, have to, have to make a shift. They have to start behaving more like smaller, more entrepreneurial firms. They have to strange, change their structure. They have to change their management style. What's required at this end of the spectrum is the ability to be close to customers, to be responsive, to be fast in responses. And at this end of the spectrum, you expect control and hierarchy, professionalism, and so forth. So the real challenge, I think, is for organizations that are used to operating at this end of the spectrum, is how do they shift themselves to become more like organizations at this end of the scale? If you look at some of the case studies of uh, organizations that have been privatized, for example, telecommunications or the gas industry, where they've broken up into smaller companies and separate companies, they've had to make some dramatic changes. So what I'd say is that there's a, a really interesting model here. I'm interested in exploring with companies, how do they experience the product cycle? How influential is that on the way they are structured and the way are they are managed? And if it is true that the business environment is getting more competitive and there's more rivalry, then to sustain themselves as organization, what changes do they need to make to keep pace? Well, that's my thoughts on that. Thank you.